the start of this next series of Nurse Digest webinars. Thanks for joining us. Today, I'm joined by Alicia Graham and Jenny Snegavaya from the Digital Health Agency. And they're going to speak to you about the use of emergency access break glass function in my health record. This presentation begins with APNA and the Australian Digital Health Agency acknowledging our First Nations peoples as traditional custodians of the lands on which we're all meeting today. I pay respect to elders past and present and to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people that are joining us today. I'm coming to you from Wadawurrung country in Victoria. So let's get started. I'm going to hand over to Alicia and to Jenny. All right, thank you very much for that, Margaret. Um, so like she said, we are looking at the use of emergency access or also known as the break glass function in my health record. So I am Alicia, I'm a digital health educator with the Australian Digital Health Agency. And I am joined by Jenny, who is working in the compliance team also in the Digital Health Agency. And we're gonna share the presentation today as we go through. Now, I am going to turn my camera off now just to preserve some bandwidth and make sure everything's running as smoothly as possible as we can with our digital technology, uh, but I will pop it back on when we do our questions and answers at the end. Okay, so today we are going to be discussing the My Health Record and specifically the emergency access function. But firstly, I do want to set the scene by describing what My Health Record is and its place in our healthcare system. So, My Health Record is an online summary of an individual's key health information. It is not designed to be a complete record or to replace any existing records. It is really, really meant to be a complementary source of information for you. It also does not replace that direct communication that we are having between our healthcare providers and our patients. It is simply just another source of information that may not have been accessible to you previously. Now it is personally controlled, so a person can choose if and when they interact with their My Health record, as well as what's in their record and who can access it. They can also nominate a representative to help manage their record on their behalf. Also important to note, it is part of a national system, so it is available anywhere around Australia. It can be accessible at all times, and that My Health record is also protected by multiple layers of cybersecurity, as well as by legislation. Now, as I said, My Health record is governed by legislative frameworks, and this really specifies who can access the My Health record and use the information within the system. Now, participating organisations and healthcare providers must comply with this legislation. So this includes the My Health Records Act, which establishes the role and function of the system operator, and the system operator is the Australian Digital Health Agency. Now, a registration framework for individuals and entities such as healthcare provider organisations to participate in the system is also covered under this act. And of course, we're looking at the privacy framework. Of course, it's aligning with the Privacy Act as well as the My Health Record Act. And this specifies which entities can access and use information in the system and the penalties that can be imposed on any improper use of this information. Now, a very common question that we get asked by healthcare provider is whether you can, you have permission or you need to get permission to access the patient's My Health Record. So any healthcare provider that is involved in the person's healthcare who is authorised by the healthcare organisation can access a My Health record. So they don't need additional permission of a person to view this record and a person's record can be accessed outside of a consultation. Of course, this is provided that they're accessing it for the purpose of providing healthcare to the patient. So a really good example for this one is if you're a practice nurse, you might be getting information on a new patient prior to them coming into the practice to make sure you're getting all this relevant uh, past history or medications. So you're not actually having them in your consultation, but uh, you are doing it for the purposes of providing care. Now, this also uploads to, uh, sorry, applies to uploading information to my health record. So a healthcare provider is authorized to upload. However, they must comply with any requests from a patient who does not want information uploaded to the my health record. Now, providers are under no legal obligation to use the My Health Record system. It is up to your clinical, dis clinical discretion to decide if this might be useful to you to view or upload information to My Health Record. 
Now, there are some controls at the patient level, which are really an integral feature of the My Health record. So the first one is that a patient can choose to restrict access to specific documents in their My Health record. And what they can do then is then establish a limited document access code, or also known as an LDAC. So they can then pr provide a code for this limited document access code to any organization that they wish to have access to those restricted documents. What they can also do is restrict access to their entire record by establishing a record access code, or also known as a RAC code. Now that will mean that only organizations that are given this code can access any part of the patient's My Health record. Now, if it is necessary to lessen or prevent serious threat to life, health or safety, a clinician can exercise a break glass function, also known as emergency access. Um, but I do want to remind you here that instances are monitored and logged. And of course, we're going to go into this in a lot more depth as we go along this presentation today. Individuals can also subscribe to SMS or email alerts that are going to report in real time to them when a new healthcare provider organisation has accessed their My Health record. With all instances of My Health record, it is monitored and logged, so they'll be able to see uh, what you've gone into, what you've done in there, and who's done that. Now, what happens when a patient has set access controls? So where a record access code, so that's one that's uh, locking out of the entire My Health record, if that's in place, the provider will be prompted by the clinical software to enter the code. So there are usually different colored indicators on the My Health record icon. Sometimes that is or isn't applicable depending on your clinical information software. And basically this is to suggest if the patient's record has a record access code in place or not. Now, where documents have been restricted in the record, so using an LDAC is set up, um, that won't be visible by looking at the record. So you won't know that there is restricted documents on that record unless the patient is actually providing you the code for that limited document access code. Now, here we can see an example of dispensing software and the prompt that comes up. So in this uh, particular area, a patient has no, if a patient has no restrictions, so no codes, it's just a normal My Health record, they can choose the general access option and go and you look at the documents list without putting any codes in. Now, if you have been provided with a record access code or a limited document access code by your patient, what you can do in this particular instance is select the second option, which is to proceed with an access code by entering that code and clicking OK to then view that information. Now, again, I will emphasize it's going to be very different according to what clinical information system you're using. Some of them won't pop up with any uh, dialog box if there's no record codes. It will only pop up if there's a record access code where you need to input that and go through that process to then gain access to the patient's My Health record. So now I'm going to pass over to Jenny and she's going to go through how do you actually access a record in an emergency. Thanks so much, Alicia, for um, the introduction and um, kind of describing to everyone what um, controls are available and people can set on their My Health record um, if they would like. Um, I'll also just make a quick mention that if anybody has um, any questions they'd like to ask us, please feel free to pop them into the um, chat box or the Q&A um, function so that we can respond to them at the end of the uh, presentation. But um, I guess the next um, step is for us to um, have a think about situations where um, patients may have applied some of these access controls, um, but they uh, are not able to um, provide kind of their consent or provide a copy of their um, code to you for you to be able to um, access their record. So, um, that can happen in an emergency. Um, so in those uh, very specific uh, circumstances, it is possible for healthcare providers to, to bypass some of these access controls um, and, and gain access into the person's um, 
record, which is called the uh, emergency access function. So this is very clearly defined in Section 64 of the My Health Record Act, um, which actually outlines the specific criteria that clinicians are required to meet to be able to lawfully and appropriately use the emergency access function um, wh where there is a need to kind of bypass those consumer access controls. So on the next slide, we've got um, a summary of what the criteria is. So the emergency access provision can only be used by healthcare providers where you reasonably believe that access is necessary to lessen or prevent a serious threat to the individual's life, health and safety. And when it's not reasonable and practicable for you to obtain uh, consent of the recipient um, whose record you're wanting to view. Um, or you may believe that access is necessary to prevent or lessen a serious threat to public health or public safety. So the emergency access function was specifically designed to be used um, when um, this criteria is met. In other situations, um, you do need to um, discuss, I guess, with the patient whether they're happy to provide you with um, some of the access codes that they may have set on their record, uh, or you can view um, other kind of unrestricted information that's available in their record um, without using this function if, if it doesn't apply in the situation where you're kind of seeing the patient. Um, so on the next slide, we've just got an example of what the function kind of looks like in, in some clinical information systems. In this example, we've got best practice. It's quite a commonly used um, clinical information system. But of course, keep in mind that if you use a different um, software program, um, there might be a different way for you to um, access the function. So um, do have a look at some um, you know, specific guides um, for your software product um, and, and familiarize yourself with how to use the function. We also have some um, information sheets available on our agency's website, which describe how to use the function uh, appropriately in, in some software products. So see, see if that's relevant to your um, organization, the product you use. But um, basically what would happen when a clinician is um, trying to access an individual's My Health Record, uh, there would be a, a My Health Record button that they, you know, typically select, click on to open up an individual's um, document list where a person has placed a record access code, you will get a pop-up box uh, appearing where you can enter the code. So you can see a blank space in the box there where um, if the individual is able to provide you with a code, you can enter the code and you can click OK to progress and view their record. If you have an access code that the patient has given you, you do not need to tick the emergency access um, checkbox. You just simply enter the code and you click OK to proceed. Um, if the patient forgot what their code is, they can call the My Health Record helpline and they can either obtain their code or reset their code. Um, but the emergency fu access function was not designed for situations where someone's forgotten their code. It is um, designed specifically for um, uh, those criteria where there's a threat to the individual's health or safety. Um, so keep in mind that um, if someone's forgotten their code, you are best to direct them to the My Health Record helpline. Um, but obviously in situations where um, a patient isn't able to provide a code and the emergency access criteria that I kind of outlined earlier have been met, then um, you do have um, the option to, to progress uh, by using the emergency access function. If you do uh, think it is valuable for you to uh, view the individual's My Health record, um, so you can actually check the emergency access kind of tick box, click OK. Okay, um, and you will then um, see another pop-up uh, will appear usually on your screen, which is displayed on the right-hand side on the slide. Um, and it reminds you of the conditions that apply uh, when you use this function. And if you definitely are happy to proceed, you can click yes and, and you will then um, be um, able to view that individual's My Health record. So this function will override any access 
access controls that they have um, and it will allow you access to view their information including any restricted documents that they have in their record. Um, this function can also be used if you um, suspect an individual has um, some restricted documents or a limited document access code um, on some of their documents, you can use this function to, to access um, them as well if needed, if the criteria has been met. Um, on the next slide, we've got just a summary of some ways in which um, the emergency access function is monitored. So um, as I showed you on the previous slide, uh, you are prompted um, when, when emergency access has been activated. You do get that pop-up box uh, where you are required to confirm if you wish to proceed. And if you decide actually it's not the correct use of the function, um, there is no emergency, then you can actually click no and, and exit um, you know the system without viewing someone's my health record so you do have that option to progress or go back if um, you've made an error um, every emergency access will be listed in the individual's access history so they can have a look at um, their history in my health record and see um, what organizations have accessed their record and they'll they will be able to see that emergency access was used to view their record. Um, some individuals can choose um, to set a notification. So they might actually receive an SMS or an email notification alerting them that the function was used. Um, and the agency also um, does uh, very routine kind of monitoring um, of the function as well. So um, usually we do recommend that if you have needed to use um, the emergency access function, um, it might be good practice for you to keep a record of um, the specific situation that occurred um, and um, make a note of why the function was used. So you can um, have some sort of an emergency access register in your organization, or you can um, make a record in the patient's file that, you know, on this day, emergency access function was used to view their My Health Record for, you know, this this reason and describe the scenario because um, the agency as a system operator of my health record um, will uh, usually um, kind of go back to organizations who we know have used the function um, and just request them to kind of um, review the, the case and make sure that the function was used appropriately. Um, so what does that look like? Um, we've got a screenshot of um, a letter that the agency um, sends out on a monthly basis. It's our emergency access guidance email. And this is, sh this is shared with organizations um, who we know have used the function during a specific month. Um, and it includes um, an attachment which will list out the exact, um, uh, I guess, uh, date, time, um, you know, user ID number and an identifying number of the um, healthcare recipient um, where we know the emergency access function was used. So basically the email is a request for the organization to review the circumstances um, for that particular access to so that the organization can determine um, if it was um, in accordance with um, authorised provisions under Section 64 of the um, My Health Records Act, or if um, you think um, maybe there was a, an error made or the function wasn't used appropriately. Um, so that can include uh, the organization reviewing their records, um, speaking with the healthcare provider, kind of discussing, um, you know, why emergency access was used on that particular occasion and, and determining whether it was in fact appropriate or if it wasn't inappropriately um, used kind of scenario on that particular um, occasion. <clears throat> If an organization decides that there was um, a, an emergency scenario and the function was used appropriately, there's no um, requirement for organizations to respond to the agency's letter. Um, but if it is uh, determined that 
maybe um, the function wasn't used in accordance with um, the correct provisions, um, the organization does need to consider their data breach um, reporting obligations. So under section 75 of the My Health Records Act, um, organizations do need to notify the agency um, of any potential or actual data breaches that may have occurred and that can include the emergency access function um, as well. So um, we do have some information on our website, um, which is linked at the bottom of the slide here. Um, if you do uh, need to make such a notification to the agency, you can um, review some information on the website that will hopefully help you decide um, if you need to report um, the situation or not. And um, it will include a form that you need to submit to the agency and, 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 and other steps that you may need to um, follow in relation to making that report as well. So um, we do regular monthly monitoring of the function. We um, analyze for, for trends, which can help us identify organizations that have used um, the function or individual healthcare providers as well. Um, and we can and um, then go to kind of organizations um, requesting for them to, to review those accesses and, and determine if they um, need to notify an agency of a data breach. So um, hopefully that gives everyone um, a bit of an insight into how we monitor the use of the function and how to use it appropriately. Um, but I'll pass on to you, um, Alicia, to um, wrap up the presentation. All right, thank you, Jenny. That was really insightful and I'm hoping everyone just got a load of information um, and feel a lot more comfortable around when you do and don't have to do things. That's great, thank you. So I'm going to now go through um, the penalties for misuse of information. Now, I really want to start off by saying my health record is there to assist healthcare providers deliver that better healthcare for their patients. And um, this is authorised use of my health record. Now, appropriate access and use of my health record system is taken very seriously. Now, the My Health Record legislation is all about encouraging the use of my health record by clinicians and not penalizing you. So, if you are a clinician providing healthcare, then you are encouraged to use the My Health Record. However, any inappropriate use of my health record can result in penalties that uh, have now been increased. So there are significant fines and penalties for inappropriate or unauthorized use of the information. So penalties may be applied for a number of things such as unauthorized collection, use or disclosure of health information in a record, use of health information in a record for prohibited purposes, unauthorized use of disclosure, sorry, or disclosure of health healthcare identifiers or other information obtained for the purpose of providing healthcare identifiers service. Failure to give written notice within 14 days if the healthcare provider or organisation ceases to be eligible to be registered for the My Health Record. So if for whatever reason your organisation can no longer be, uh, is not eligible to be registered for My Health Record, you do need to notify the agency within 14 days. Failure to notify an actual or potential data breach in which the healthcare provider or organisation was directly involved holding, taking, processing or handling records held for the purposes of a system outside of Australia or causing someone else to do so. So they're, they're pretty straightforward ones that, that are misuse. So we'd like to think that people using the My Health Record are not going to be falling into this area, but it's something we definitely need to be aware of. Now, um, what we do want to look at is some examples of inappropriate use. So emergency access is not designed to be used for the following. So it's not designed to be used to check whether any restricted documents exist. Of course, like Jenny was speaking about before, there is that exception of as if there is um, it's fitting that criteria of emergency access where you believe that there is uh, a threat to that person's 
um, health, life or safety um, and it's impractical or unreasonable to get that consent or of course that you're trying to lessen or prevent a serious threat to the public's health or safety. So that still applies to that as an exception to that rule but if it's just because you're curious or you know the patient's in there and there's no problem you could get that code off them but you're just curious that's not what it's designed for. It's not designed to gain access when an individual has forgotten the access code, which Jenny has already gone, gone through with you. So again, that exception applies to here. So if they're fitting that eligibility criteria for emergency access, then you can use it. To view your own My Health record or a record of a family member, it's not designed to demonstrate the use of the emergency access function. So if you are wanting to see how that emergency access function works in your clinical system, the agency does have an online training portal where there are a range of working versions of like best practice, medical director, Genie, ZMed, and things like that. Um, there is a fictitious patient called Isabella Hungerford who has a record access code that is on the test patient there and that will give you the chance to go through and use emergency access functionality in that really safe test environment. So if you're wanting to see it yourself or other colleagues you're wanting to talk about emergency access and what that looks like, definitely go into that test environment. Don't use your patients in your particular clinical information softwares. It is also important to note here that any unlawful use of emergency access function is subject to civil and or criminal penalties under the My Health Records Act 2012, as we discussed those penalties earlier. So that's bringing us to a close here, but I just wanted to let you know that if you're wanting to learn more about My Health Record, um, you can access a number of free different interactive online e-learning modules via the Australian Digital Health Agency's online learning portal. Now, if you're wanting to find more information around the emergency access, we do have a range of education and guidance materials that can really assist you with your understanding of this break glass function. Now, it does have, the agency does provide an overview on our digital health website. There's also a podcast available on it. We also run regular webinars. They're actually on-demand webinars, which will assist, assist you um, and your organisation to learn a bit more about emergency access function and when you can use that and um, that sort of thing. Now you can watch those at any time because they are on demand. The Office of Australian Information Commissioner, the OAIC, also has a range of resources including a guidance, an FAQ document and a flowchart on the emergency access function. That flowchart's really handy if you're wanting to see when you should and shouldn't use this emergency access function. And we would really encourage you to share these resources with your colleagues who haven't been able to attend today. Now, if you are needing any further support, you're more than welcome to contact us via the My Health Record helpline, the 1800 number, or of course, you can email us at help at digitalhealth.gov.au. More than happy to help you out with your questions when you need them. All right, we are up to the questions and answers portion of this session. So we'll just see if there's any questions that have come through. Thanks, Alicia. Um, someone's just asked if they discover that the emergency access was used inappropriately, is the digital health agency process all that they need to follow? Happy to respond yeah. to that one. Um, I would definitely encourage that organisation to have a look at the agency's website, digitalhealth.gov.au, um, and search for our data breaches um, page, which describes the process that does need to be followed, um, which includes usually notifying um, the agency of, of the matter and describing kind of the situation that occurred. Um, usually also organisations have to contact or notify um, the OAIC, Office of the Australian Information Commissioner, um, and that um, information and a link to that is also available on our website. Um, but there may also be other internal kind of processes or policies that um, an organisation uh, may need to, to follow. So typically organisations would have their own um, data breach uh, policy and they would um, respond in accordance um, with that policy. So um, in addition to agencies' processes, you may also need to notify the OAIC and follow other internal um, processes as well. 
Great. Thank you for that. So that does make sense. Uh, a lot of organisations, of course, will have a data breach policy, but they may or may not have actually thought about putting the My Health Record access as a part of that. So that's um, that's great. Thank you very much for that. Um, I am, I, um, we're at nearly at the end of time, but to stay on a little bit longer, um, we're aware that there's been a lot of information in this presentation today, but the recording will be available and it'll be up on APNA's digital health webpage um, in, a, in the next cu couple of days. So you'll be able to look back and actually see um, the recording and actually have some further information, which will be helpful for you. So I would like to um, thank you for joining us today for the Nurse Digest and thanks to our presenters, Alicia and Jenny. We hope that you're able to join our next webinar, which will be held on the 8th of February next year. And it'll be about pathology and diagnostic imaging default uploads to My Health Record. And that's been a bit of a contentious issue lately. So that um, session will be really interesting. We're going to leave the Zoom meeting open just for a few minutes now. So you can please complete the brief evaluation um, poll if you haven't done it already. But thanks, everyone. We really appreciate your time at this time of the year. And we'll see you for the next Nurse Digest in February of next year. Thanks, everyone.